Well, here is a look at the Ford Big Board, built for America, built Ford proud. Here is a look at the points per game allowed by the Patriots this season. Weeks 1 through 6, defense okay, not great. 7 through 13, though, the Pats allowed just 10.4 points per game. Incredible run there. But after the bye, defense fell apart, allowing 30 points per game. Boston Sports Journal's Greg Bedard shared an explanation on Felger and Maz yesterday. At some point in time after the bye week, uh, from what I hear, there's a disconnect between the coaching staff and the players in terms of you know, what they're being asked to do, how they're being coached. I think there's a chance that during the bye week, Bill said, you know what? Things are going well now. Steve, Gerard, you got it back. And now all of a sudden, the players start questioning like, all right, well, is this Bill's game plan or whose is this? Who am I listening to, Steve or Gerard? That is where we begin our deep dive today into what's going on with the coaching staff down in Foxborough, Phil Perry, Tom Giles, alongside me. Uh, Phil, um, do you believe what Greg Bedard is hearing, that there is a disconnect in that locker room when it comes to coaching, in particular on the defensive side of the ball? I think what the Patriots have had on the defensive side of the ball has been relatively consistent for the last two-plus years really starting the end of 2019, which we remember was Brian Flores' first year not here, where you had Gerard Mayo and Steve Belichick start to be more involved. Same case all of 2020. Same case, again, that's my understanding, 2021. Bill Belichick could be leading the meetings on any given day. Gerard Mayo could lead portions of meetings. Steve Belichick could lead portions of meetings depending on, okay, who's going to be talking about game plan and calls versus who's going to be talking about the other team's personnel this week. That's how they would share those duties and divvy them up. And is there a clouded message, perhaps, Giles, because you have so many different voices that are talking to the players? I guess that could be the case for some. I just haven't spoken to any who felt that way. And again, because this has been sort of the standard operating procedure for a little while now, it didn't necessarily come up as the reason for why things went the way they went late in that season. The reason I was given talking to some people this week is that essentially they feel like, number one, it's hard to put their finger on it, but they just felt like they didn't handle the pressure of being the top dog in the conference, which they were going into their bye, well enough. Still a relatively new team. We know they've got a lot of new players, and they just became the hunted, so to speak, and they didn't handle it the way they needed to. That's what I've been told over the course of the last couple of days. Yeah, and on top of that, too, I mean, going back to the question of, you know, Greg Bedard, what he said right there, you don't have any reason to not believe what he said right there based on what you heard, not just uh, from some of the comments that come out in the last few days, but during the season, too. You know, you would see some of the veterans on this defense frustrated when they're struggling down the stretch. You, you heard Matthew Slater, some of the comments he had uh, about kind of guys just buying in. So that does feel like there's a disconnect there, even though Matthew Slater doesn't play on the defensive side of the ball. But something wasn't right it, you know and, and to Phil's point if you have multiple voices telling you what to do who are you supposed to listen to you're looking around like well am I supposed to do what Gerard said what what Steven said what does Bill want us to do it, it gets mucked up a little and Giles fair or unfair a number of these guys have um, kind of come of age with Gerard Mayo maybe they played with him or knew him as you know just a Patriots veteran who would be around the team as a broadcaster um, it's, you know, it, it wouldn't be far-fetched to me to think, well, if Steve Belichick is the one who's, quote-unquote, more in charge, that, they're, that they might not look at it and go, but why not Gerard Mayo? Why are the duties split? So the other thing on top of that, too, is not just what you mentioned about Gerard Mayo's resume, but from an energy perspective, at least from watching it from the outside, right? Gerard Mayo seems like that energy guy that, that other guys would feed off of. I don't know if you see that from Steve Belichick, so I think that probably contributes to it as well, Phil. I think it is fair to say that, that Steve Belichick is just going to be more reserved than Gerard Mayo is, and Gerard Mayo probably going to be a little bit more natural in front of a room full of professional athletes. He was essentially, I mean, it's a cliche, but he was for years, he was a quote-unquote coach on the field, and now he has moved into this official coaching capacity, and I think it just comes naturally to him. And again, the people I've spoken with haven't said this is an issue for us, that we have multiple people disseminating messages. But when you play the way they did down the stretch, it leads to questions, and I think those questions are fair. And I think the question now is if Gerard Mayo, Trenny, moves on and takes a head coaching job, is Steve Belichick ready to be defensive coordinator? I think, I think it could be one of those situations where you don't really know until he's actually in that 
role, right, and understands what he has to do to bring whatever it is that is needed at that role and in that position of the coaching staff. Well, there's one guy who thinks that maybe some changes need to be made. The Boston Globe's Dan Shaughnessy addressing the elephant in the room, writing this, when Bill Belichick's team delivers a defensive stink bomb like Saturdays in Buffalo, coaching is going to come into question. The hoodie acknowledged that the Bills were clearly the better coached team. When the head coach says that and his son may be the team's defensive coordinator, well, you should see my inbox. It's awkward and probably unfair. I mean, who among us wouldn't want our children working with us in the family business? But it is still uncomfortable at times like this. Delicate. It puts everyone in a box. It is the elephant in the room. Back here with Phil. Curran rejoins us as well. I mean... Listen, he's not going to fire his kids, Curran. I mean, that's just... I, I, I well, have if they to sucked, imagine. he would. Do you think he would? Yeah, Do you if think they if they sucked, sucked he would? Uh, 100%. If they sucked, they wouldn't be doing the jobs. I mean, Bill is that much of a bottom-line individual. And I have never once, Trent, heard anyone say that Stephen Belichick doesn't put the time in, doesn't know what he's talking about, or same thing with Brian, who is probably the more outgoing of the two. But, you know, we've spent time with him, um, Phil and I, and, and I'm sure you have another question on this training, but... I cut you off because no, okay. they're not inept. I understand when you collapse the way the Patriots did over the last five weeks, questions deserve to be asked. Whether his name is Stephen Jones or Stephen Belichick, you have to say, what's that guy do? But to me, it's an experienced coach who's not, you know, the lucky sperm club. Yeah, I think... I think when you look at how the, the staff has functioned, I think the staff as a, as a group is interesting to look at, right, Trini? It's a lot of young coaches, whether it's Steve and Brian Belichick or whether it's Mike Pellegrino or any other number of guys. Like, I, I can remember going back to, to 2018 where they didn't have a defensive coordinator that year, right? Brian Flores was the de facto defensive coordinator. But alongside Brian Flores, they had a lot of very experienced coaches on mm -hmm. that side of the ball, whether it was Josh Boyer or Brendan Daly or a number of others. And they were able to sort of distribute the coaching responsibilities on that side among them. And it was maybe a little bit easier for them to understand what had to go into each person's gig because they had been doing it for a long time. It's just not the case with these guys now. This is more of an up-and-coming group. It's a younger group that's still learning. And, Curran, I, you know, I, I guess when you were talking mm -hmm. um, and, and I looked like I wanted to ask something, it was <laughs> that, you know, I, no, I guess no one's saying that Steve Belichick or Brian Belichick aren't good at what they right. do. But when we talk about Gerard Mayo and you talk about his experience um, as a football player, how he was sort of always a coach on the field, the respect he commands, but also the way he carries himself. He's getting a lot of head coaching interviews for a reason. People see something in him. So I do wonder if where maybe the frustration lies is – why is Steve Bell? It, it, it's it seems, hard. It's Look, like why is Steve Belichick maybe getting to wear the headset and call the plays, and people are going, "What? If you're really doing what's best for the team, is this what's best for the team?" And Bill had to know when he made the hire that this would come to the fore. He's not not a coordinator because he's trying to be protected by Bill from taking any um, broadsides. That happens all the time, whether it be Josh McDaniels back in the 2000s where Steve Belichick and Brian Flores and Matt Patricia now. But he has to understand that this is going to happen. You know, Stephen was credited specifically for the performance against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's wearing the headset. The camera finds him much more than Mayo. My understanding is that Mayo does a heck of a lot more than he is given credit for, which is what is kind of being borne out in some of these interviews. And when the opportunity for co-coordinators was broached with Stephen and Gerard last year, uh, that idea was eschewed by by Gerard Mayo and said, you know, you know what, I, I don't know if that's going to reflect things exactly the way I want it to be, so no, let's not do that. Phil, do you ever uh, think that Bill Belichick will start to re-examine and maybe realign his coaching staff? I mean, I was shocked today. I, I put in our email, I needed to ask one of you guys, like, when is the last time, and for, and for our, I mean, let's be honest, they've been really, really good for the last two decades, but it's not like when things do go badly. I, I can't think of a time that they fired a coach. And you mentioned Dean Pease. That was the last time. It was like early 2000s. Is this the time maybe, Phil, to take a look at the construction of his coaching staff and say, maybe some things need to change. Maybe we need some fresh voices, maybe some more mature voices. Well, I, I think he'll look at everything, right? And that will include the coaching staff and how can they be more efficient? How can they be better? I think what's interesting is this offseason, there are a lot of former Patriots coaches who are suddenly available, whether it's Joe Judge, 
from the Giants or Patrick Graham probably from the Giants will become available. You know, Steve Gregory is a secondary coach uh, down in Miami. You know, these are all guys who have Patriots experience, Patriots ties certainly, and they understand the language that is spoken here. But Tom, the issue to me would be Bill Belichick seems like, and we've seen this for many years, someone who likes to bring up younger coaches mm -hmm. because of the effort that they put in and the hunger that they have and because they are, you know, they're blank slates essentially when they start. So would he want to bring in an experienced group of people that have run their own ship and maybe step on the toes of some of the younger yeah, guys that are trying to I know we got to wrap, but I just want to say this. If you keep doing that, you're never going to get diverse viewpoints. So he may have uh, by force to get diverse viewpoints because he might lose a guy like Gerard Mayo. Con continuing his interview tour today, he interviewed for the Denver Broncos head coaching job. Uh, nice in Denver, though, to uh, inform us of exactly how things are going. Uh, the interview <laughs> has been completed, everybody. Um, so if, if we've been talking a lot about Gerard Mayo versus Steve Belichick, who has more control over the defense, uh, Tom, if for some reason Gerard Mayo does leave for a head coaching, job, head coaching job, then by de facto, does Steve Belichick actually finally get that title? And do they, do they give it to him? Does it go to somebody else? Like, how do they handle that? I don't know. I mean, it would make sense. He has been in that position. Matt Patricia, did Matt Patricia ever get the, the title, Phil? He did. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. He, he, you, you give the he title spent one year where he didn't have it, and then he got it. Here is what's interesting about it. When Bill Belichick was with the Giants, I'm sure he coveted the defensive coordinator title so that it would help his career. When he was with the New York Jets, after being with the Patriots, he was assistant head coach and secondary coach here in New England. When he went back to the Jets, they needed to give him a coordinator title so they could have payment commensurate with where he was. Now, with the Patriots, having titles is looked upon as a credit grab. If you want a title, well, we don't do titles around here. It's all for one, one for all. Yeah, but you kind of need titles sometimes. I agree. Bill didn't feel know? that way at the end of the 90s, at the end of the 80s, but now it's playing hide-and-seek with who does what. I don't think it's fair. So what, what is the feeling about Matt Patricia down there, Phil? Because for, at least from the outside looking in, I think people are, are head-scratching as to why he has whatever control he has. Well, number one, he's trusted by Bill Belichick, right? Uh, that's, that's why he's there. And I... I have heard it that he is essentially kind of a coaching utility man. If they need him in the defensive meeting, he'll be in the defensive meeting. He'll be in the special teams meetings. Uh, maybe he's contributing even occasionally offensively. I, I think he is wherever you need a guy because he has the experience that he does working on both sides of the ball, being a head coach, they feel comfortable with him in some different spots. But I, I don't think he is, you know, the puppet master or the Wizard of Oz here when it comes to this Patriots defense kind of pulling the strings from, uh, from behind the scenes. There's two different things with Patricia that are at play. One is he's here in New England to lick his wounds after what happened in Detroit. And my perception is he has always been kind of an individual on the make. Wherever he is, he's trying to get to the next spot. When he was here with the Patriots, he was trying to become defensive coordinator. He was defensive coordinator. He was coveting a head coaching job. Now that he's lost a head coaching job, he's back with the Patriots. Well, what's his next target? Mm -hmm. I think coaching would be a bridge too far for him, especially with what he did in Detroit. So it then becomes, who's the best at currying the favor of Bill Belichick? Matt Patricia has never been shy about being obvious and trying to curry the favor of Bill Belichick, which then leads to people around the staff going, what's he doing? And I think that that, in and of itself, can have a negative impact. Again, yeah. he was not an accomplished coach with the Detroit Lions, and his last two stints, last two games here with the Patriots, they almost lost to the Jaguars and Blake Bortles. And they gave up 41 points to Nick Foles and the Eagles in that Super Bowl. And then he goes on to run the Detroit Lions aground. So I don't understand the gifted nature yeah. of the expertise that he offers. 